Um, welcome everybody to our lab here um, in the Woodlands, Texas. I'm here with Dr. Simon Bates. I'm Chris Carolyn, and we thank you all for sticking around. Uh, it was uh, a great event we had today, and um, we want to thank everybody who was involved. We had a lot of collaborators, and um, a lot of you know of our experts here from Ragaku, a lot of external um, industry experts. Really, just a uh, uh, you know, really coming together the minds to try and educate, um, you know, the pharma community a little bit more. A lot of content, you know, over 50 sessions. And just as a reminder, everybody has 30 days to review the content um, on this platform. We're also going to have a lot of stuff over on our uh, Pharma Technologies website. And, you know, Simon, there's so much content, but all of it's really good. Uh, as people go back and look through the content, uh, what would be some highlights you think they should, should look out for? Well, Chris, what was surprising uh, to me about the event was really the breadth of uh, technologies that were on show. It was a veritable smorgasbord of analytical capabilities and the benefits that they bring uh, to the pharmaceutical development life cycle. You know, if I had to pick some highlights, um, I check my notes, uh, some of the topics that immediately come to mind, well, the first one is um, in-situ non-ambient uh, X-ray diffraction. So this is a, an X-ray powder diffractometer that's combined with a DSC together in a, in a single instrument. But not only is this unit capable of performing uh, simultaneous uh, DSC and XRD measurements, but at the same time you can control and scan humidity. And in my opinion, that, that, that's a completely unique functionality. It's like multiple instruments uh, in one. So it's a completely unique combination, I think. So the measurement optics are traditionally uh, Bragg-Montano uh, reflection optics, the traditional optics. And the phase transitions, either whether they're driven by temperature or humidity driven, these are monitored by, by changes in the heat flow with respect to the reference sample. Okay. so. People can measure the effects of temperature and humidity together with the same instrument? Absolutely. It, it's completely unique. Awesome. Like if you're screening a sample for um, somebody to use in, in Texas, so they have a drug product that some uh, patient will be taking in Texas, they leave it on the dashboard of their car, 110 degrees, 90% no, humidity. You want to know what's going to happen. Is it going to be a viable drug product after that? Definitely. So to, another point, uh, throughout the day we've talked a lot about uh, pharmaceutical equivalence and the need of, of a level, a Q3 level, which currently doesn't exist. And that level should take into account uh, the microstructure of the drug product for a more robust relationship between pharmaceutical and therapeutic equivalents. This fits sort of hand in glove with the capabilities of the X-ray CT microscope. X-ray CT, I mean, it really is an amazing technology. When I first thought, saw that, it just sort of blew me away, the capabilities. But it allows you to do 3D mapping of drug product microstructure in, in incredible detail. Uh, you can see issues with the coating uniformity or if the coating is not a, a sticking well or it's peeling off. Um, and you can see inside the bulk of the material looking at fractures and voids uh, any, and also inhomogeneity or homogeneity of the products inside. And this data is all collected, say three-dimensionally, you can view it on a computer for all sorts, you know, slice and dice the data. And it's completely non-destructive. So if needs be, you can match that microstructure with uh, downstream measurements like further dissolution testing. So it really is an amazing technology, and I encourage you all to take a look at it. So with this tool, they would be able to catch maybe new points of failure that they haven't been able to catch before. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a common occurrence in uh, in drug product manufacturing is that the products you're about to release fail the dissolution test. So once they failed, you have to put the whole thing on hold. You've got to go into an investigation to find a root cause. Why did it fail? And a lot of the times that's, that's really difficult, if not impossible. If you can't solve it, then the batch is gone. But if you had like a micro CT imaging where you could see the, you know, the voids, the cracks, issues with the coating, you could probably identify a root cause early on 
or even early in development cycle, identify things that could be problematic later to cause dissolution failure uh, down the road. Okay, sounds like a valuable tool for KC. I would say so, absolutely. Another highlighted area of great risk that uh, came out in a number of talks and also in the round table was this issue of narrow therapeutic index drugs. These are drugs that only function when the API is, is dosed at a, at a very, very specific level. And if it's too low, it, it, it's not going to give the therapeutic response if you want. And if it's too high, it can be life-threatening. So you have to hit this dose level really, really accurately. And a lot of these um, narrow therapeutic index, index drugs are highly potent, which means they're present at a very low level in the API. Uh, an example that we've used a lot today and, and comes to mind is levothyroxine, which I believe is the most recalled drug in FDA history. And the drug loading is, is incredibly low. In fact, it's so low that using standard analytical techniques, it's almost impossible to detect uh, or quantify within the drug product itself. So the monitoring of content uniformity to get some idea of, of QC or you know, exactly what is the patient going to be receiving, you know, it's just almost impossible to do within the drug product. But we've seen that XRF, X-ray fluorescence measurements, they're sensitive enough, easily sensitive enough, to detect the iodine present within the levothyroxine, even at these incredibly low loading levels. And not just identify it, but they're able to quantify it using fundamental parameters techniques or even using calibrated techniques. And again, it's completely non-destructive content uniformity testing. So you can just take one pill, throw it in a cup, press a button, you know, and within seconds you can get a reading of what is the content quantitatively of the iodine and hence the levothyroxine in the drug product itself. So not only is it, uh, sounds like another non-destructive technique that maybe could be utilized a lot more, but probably because it's not destructive, it's going to save a lot of time and you know energy into processing these materials. Yeah, absolutely. If you, again, the same as with the CT. If you can get a real-time readout of content uniformity, you, know, you can see it during the production process if you're drifting. So if the content of the API from one tablet to the next or from one batch to the next is starting to drift. So it, it's incredibly important as a, as a QC tool, that, absolutely. And um, another area that really surprised me was, was handheld RAM. I mean, I've been aware of that technology for a while, but after you know, looking at the instrumentation, seeing the presentations, I hadn't realized how easy it is to use as a rapid sort of ID testing for incoming materials. You know, when I, when I worked at Triclinic Labs, we were really big believers in having a, a triaging test of all incoming material. So everything that came in, we would do some preliminary studies, usually optical microscopy, just to see what we were dealing with before we'd go for a, a deep dive and do some really heavy investigation. Um, and what I realized is the handheld Raman, you know, it gives such a wealth of information, it's so easy to use. This should be one of these common triaging tools that's in, that's in every lab. You no, know, we used to joke there should be a microscope in every office. I mean, more than that, I think there should be a handheld ramen in every office. Whenever you get materials coming in, just like zap it, what have you got? And for ID purposes, it's really very, very powerful. So uh, if it's that good and that easy to use, why, do you, why isn't it in every lab at this point? <laughs> you know, that, that's, it's a leading question. I mean, I guess it's because people are just unaware of how easy and low cost the, the, these systems are. I mean, that there should be no barrier in putting these in, in every single lab that has a microscope. Right, and that's, I mean, really for me, and I know for a lot of people in today, today's event, that's why we want to do more things like this, so people know about these techniques that can really make their lives a lot easier uh, in the office and in the lab. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And the last one I have on my notes here, but by you know, no means definitely not the least, uh, we have to talk about the micro ED system. This, this truly is a world's first, and it's, and it's absolutely incredible. It's a micro electron diffraction system for real time structure solution. So I hope you all had the opportunity of seeing the presentation that shows how this system is set up, how you do the data collection, and the real time solution. If you haven't seen it, please go back and take a look because it's, it's truly amazing. You're, you're seeing a world's first here. Um, and the ability to solve, to well, I should say the ability to routinely solve structures for small molecule organics using just a fragment of material is truly revolutionary. 
you know, this opens the door to a whole new world of crystallography. You, know, you can essentially take like dust from early development stage before you can even begin to grow a crystal and just put it on a grid and screen it and start to get crystal structures really very early on in the process. So structure, structure solutions, you know, smaller than, than ever before, it sounds like. A absolutely. Wow. Yeah. And the thing to remember is that what you're getting from this is the molecular structure as well as the crystal structure. So very, very early on when you get your first solid material out, uh, you have a chance of getting out a molecular structure immediately. You know, and that, that's a, that really is a, a big deal. It's something the industry has been waiting for for a very, very long time. You know, it was possible to do you know, in, in academic labs if you had a, a few months and a research student to throw at it. But now you can do it routinely, real time, press a button. Man, that's, that's really great. Um, I do hope people are able to see that or, or go back and review it. It's really, um, you know, some groundbreaking technology. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, a lot of good stuff there. Uh, you know, overall, uh, you know, we talk about events like this. We want to see more education in the community. Um, but for attendees and maybe those coming in a little later to review things, you know, what do you want the, uh, the main takeaway to be from, from an event? Right, well, you know, some of the attendees have asked me, uh, you know, why we hosted this pharmaceutical event. What, why did Regaco host this event? What was the intent uh, behind it? You know, and our first sort of thought was, well, really, it's an educational resource for the community uh, and for ourselves as well. But, but more than that, in a nutshell, it, it's a celebration, really. It's a celebration of the role of analytical in the drug development life cycle. I mean, realistically, it's hard to imagine you know, the level of sophistication, efficacy, and safety that we now enjoy in pharmaceutical products could ever be achieved without analytical support. You know, without analytics, analytical chemistry to study these materials, without QC, we just wouldn't be where, where we are today. Uh, and I sort of view it as a, as a marriage uh, made in heaven, hence the name, you know, pharmalytical. It's a joining, joining together of analytical and pharmaceutical technologies. You know, and as we heard during the roundtable discussion, to discuss you know, many of the current and future challenges faced by the pharmaceutical industry, we require both uh, evolutionary and revolutionary breakthroughs in analytical technology. Now, some of these breakthroughs are here now, today, and people just need to find out about them. And some are waiting for a push from the pharmaceutical community. So I'd like to reach out to the audience, all of you here, and ask for your help to open that dialogue. What analytical challenges are you facing right now, today? And what challenges do you foresee in the future? Development of new technological solutions is always a partnership, and Rigaku would like to be that future partner with you. Well said. Um, yeah, we want to be a resource uh, for this community. Um, we know more, more education never hurts. There's a lot of new stuff coming out in these days of you know, innovation, um, and there's a lot to take in. Uh, so we want to help where we can with that, uh, with events like this, you know, with, um, you know, new experiences. We've got a, a new uh, pharmaceutical technologies website that we've been building out and are launching this week in conjunction with this event, uh, where a lot of this material will be available with, um, you know, additional additional items of educational content, uh, and uh, also remember you have 30 days to check out the content on this platform as well. Uh, we want to thank all the contributors to the event. This is really a team effort, um, and I think it came out you know really well. Uh, and don't forget the podcast. Right. The podcast, um, you know, we're not going to just stop here at the education and kind of insights that we want to provide. We want to keep the industry up to date, help help push everybody forward. And one of the ways we're going to do that is a pharma, the Pharma Lab show, which is going to be a podcast uh, that Simon and some other people from Agaku are going to be hosting. Uh, so we hope you look out for that. Uh, we'll have some links in the chat for you there. Um, and otherwise, you know, we're always open. We've got all these different ways you can get in touch with us. 
uh, uh, we've got this analytical lab down in, in the Woodlands, Texas that we often have visitors for. So we're always open uh, to just better understand your challenges and, and how we can best serve uh, to help those challenges. So um, before we sign off, uh, any, last, any last words, Simon? I'll just say if you, if you want to come on to the podcast, you're more than welcome. Reach out through LinkedIn. You can reach me at Simon dash dash Bates or Bates or Simon hyphen hyphen Bates. I know it's a long one, but there's lots of Simon Bates out there, and we'll be happy to host you on the podcast. So look forward to it. Definitely. All right, everybody, that wraps up a, a successful event, I think, and um, hopefully we'll we'll see or talk to you soon.